In 1874, the city of Paris was the venue for an artistic revolution, the first exhibition of work by the artists who would become known as the Impressionists. Famously, the event was condemned and the critics were scathing. The paintings of Monet, Renoir, and others were just too radical for contemporary taste. And no artist received more of this vitriol than a solitary, brooding figure from the south of France. A painter who would be largely ignored all through his life, but whose works now sell for millions, Paul Cézanne. Cézanne was a complex, tormented individual. All his life, he found it hard to relate to his fellow humans. As a man, he was totally self-centered. As an artist, he was a true genius. By 1874, Cézanne's Impressionist work was already moving into post-Impressionism as he pursued his unique artistic vision, a vision that would inspire so many 20th century artists that Paul Cézanne is now recognized as the father of modern painting. The overall achievement of Paul Cézanne really took place after his death. And because of his retrospective exhibition in 1907 in Paris. And this affected Picasso and Braque particularly. And they turned their attention to form and the structure of painting. His vision, the way that he worked, his interpretation of the external world gave a whole series of clues which he himself would not necessarily have recognized or realized. And really he's one of the major people who was a foundation of the uh, tremendous experiments which were taking place at the beginning of the 20th century but then subsequently. And I think most major artists draw in some respect from the work of Cézanne. The Great Peak of Mont Saint-Victoire is one of the most striking features of the French region of Provence. It towers over the local communities, including the town where the life of Paul Cézanne began on the 19th of January, 1839. Growing up in this dry, dusty environment, Cézanne was enthralled by Mont Saint-Victoire. It was a fascination that would stay with him all his life and inspire some of his greatest landscapes. With hindsight, we can see this single peak as a symbol of the monumentality of Cézanne's art and the sheer size of his eventual achievement. Cézanne's achievement was significant, but his personal life was difficult from the start. His father, Louis Auguste, was a tyrannical figure, a wealthy banker who thought his timid son should be obsessed with money, as he was. But from an early age, Paul Cézanne's ambitions were strictly artistic. As a youth, he composed poetry during idyllic bathing trips in the Provence countryside. He was accompanied by a school friend who would also become a famous figure, Emile Zola. During these happy journeys away from the family home, Cézanne considered a literary career. In 1858, his friend Zola left for Paris to do exactly that. But by then, Paul Cézanne knew that his real passion was visual art. Cézanne excelled at the local drawing school. The next stage of his artistic development was obvious, a move to Paris to join his friend Zola and begin the process of becoming a great artist. But Louis-Auguste Cézanne was skeptical and insisted that his son attend law school as training for a career in the family bank. Despite letters from Zola urging his friend to break away from Provence, Cézanne gave in to his father's demands. It was never likely to work. Cézanne found law dry and uninspiring. Eventually, in 1861, he persuaded his father to give him a small allowance so that he could pursue fully his artistic vocation. In April of that year, at the age of 23, Paul Cézanne arrived in Paris in search of artistic greatness. He stayed for just six months. The metropolis was simply too much for him. 
He was rejected from the official school of fine art, and the unknown provincial felt like a complete outsider in the sophisticated city environment. He found it difficult to make friends, and soon learned that Parisian life was not all wine and romance. He was something of a country bumpkin. I don't think he fitted into Paris very well. He never did, actually. He came up as a student, and his friend Zola was there, and he got to know fellow students. But he didn't stay long to start off with, went back home, and then had another go at Paris. In November 1862, he returned to the French capital. This time, he vowed to stay. But Parisian life would still not be easy. Suzanne grew up in a respectable middle class background, and he was a bit of a misfit. And in a sense, he was uncertain of where he was in society. Also, his aspirations and his excitement about the intellectual concerns of, of the contemporary world literature in particular, uh, and of course uh, the artists who were working around. He seemed to me to be a somewhat shy and reticent figure. Cezanne's personality did not make him many friends, but the young artist still found much to appreciate in 1860s Paris. It was an exciting time for French painting. The academic orthodoxy of the Paris Salon was being challenged by realist painters such as Gustave Courbet. Edouard Manet was also exploring new artistic directions, and Cezanne admired the work of both men. But he also took time to appreciate the masterpiece of the Louvre, and he developed a special admiration for the French romantic painter, Eugène Delacroix. His early works were influenced by Delacroix. They were romantic, they were passionate, and they used the dark colouring. I think it was the romanticism of Delacroix that appealed to him in those early days. Initially, Delacroix's use of paint and dramatic subject matter was something which Suzanne clearly found exciting and fascinating. The approach of Courbet as well, with his use of thick paint, and if you look at Cezanne's early works, he was using thick paint, which, of course, he went right against uh, later on in his later work. By 1865, Cezanne was already 26 years of age, but he was still totally unknown as an artist. He was not the only one. At the Café Gerbois, a group of obscure young painters met regularly to discuss their artistic ambitions. These were the men who would become known as the Impressionists, they included Claude Monet, Auguste Renoir, Camille Pissarro, and Edgar Degas, amongst others. Paul Cézanne was also a regular at the Café Gerbois. He admired the radical spirit of his fellow young artists, but his boorish personality incensed his contemporaries. This mule-headedness also affected Cézanne's chances of exhibiting his early work. It is known that he moaned loudly about injustice when his paintings were rejected by the Salon. But his actions were far from diplomatic. He deliberately submitted his Salon entries late and accompanied them with disrespectful letters. But his Salon rejections also stemmed from the kind of work he was submitting. Early Cézannes are wild and abandoned images, depictions of dark subjects like abduction or murder. The brooding thematic concern is also present in the mysterious autopsy from 1869. Paintings like this shocked the Salon juries of the 1860s but they are now seen as important early staging posts in Cézanne's artistic development. They didn't have a discipline which he later acquired. Um, it's as if he just threw the paint on the canvas and didn't organize it very intellectually. They were emotional paintings, really, describing his state of mind, perhaps, rather than anything else. They weren't based on 
um, models. I don't think he used models for them. He used his imagination. Official rejection of his images became a regular feature of Cezanne's life, which he always took badly. He frequently returned to Provence and to a father on whom he was still financially dependent. Cezanne was terrified of his father, and this fear came through in his portraits of him. The portrait of Louis Auguste is another image from Cezanne's dark early years. There is also a sense of melancholy in his earliest still life painting. But an image such as 1870's Black Clock also hints at the powerful sense of structure that would characterize Cezanne's greatest works. Cezanne's early works on the surface don't necessarily appear to have much relationship to later work. In the sense it was still very academic and traditional, even though he's using thick paint as influenced by Delacroix, subject matter is influenced by Courbet. I find it personally not easy to see a direct relationship between his early work and his later work, except when we come to some of his landscapes. Shortly after this canvas was completed, Cezanne had more to worry about than art. In the summer of 1870, the Franco-Prussian War broke out. Like many others, Cezanne fled to avoid conscription. It was a time of change for him. He had recently taken up with a young woman, Hortense Fiquet, the first relationship of his life. So it was with his mistress that Paul Cezanne resided in the Provencal coastal town of Lastac as the war raged to the north. In Lastac, his painting also began to change as he began to explore the art of landscape. In this 1870 canvas, Snow Thor in Lastac, we can still see the strong contrast of dark and light that features in his earlier work. But with the cutting, painted in the same year, we can detect the beginnings of a lighter approach. For the first time in a Cezanne painting, we also see the mountain that he knew so well from childhood and which would feature in many of his later masterpieces. It's a rather gauche little painting, not fully worked out, but this naivety is actually what he wanted and he's not interested in the brushwork, he's interested in the shapes, which of course is something he carried on into his later work, and also that purity of vision his own feeling, his own response to the landscape comes through in this painting and in others at this period. He wanted to get a vision that was not mediated by anything that had happened in the past, the Academy, past painters. As Cezanne sat out the war on the Provence coast, his art was beginning to evolve, but his personal life was still fraught. He was so intimidated by his father that he kept his relationship with his mistress secret, even after the birth of his son, Paul, in January 1872. By then, the Franco-Prussian War was over, and Cezanne was understandably keen to be away from Provence. Shortly after his son's birth, he was invited to stay in the village of Pontoise, near Paris. His host was the one person who he did get on with, a fellow artist from the Café Gerbois, and the man who Cézanne would formally acknowledge as his master, Camille Pissarro. Pissarro was regarded as very much an anarchist and a subversive by the normal society. But in practical terms of how his relationship to artists and encouragement to people, quite diverse, he seemed to be a, a strong, uh, supportive figure, a rock there, which people could easily talk to, a sort of godlike figure, which was a paternalistic figure. And for Cezanne, this was very important at that stage. It, it helped him to find his feet, I think. Cezanne would eventually refer to Pissarro as the good god. Such was his admiration for the older man. He allowed his work to be influenced by Pissarro's technique. At Pontoise and at nearby Auvers, he painted outside more than ever before. The result was images such as View of Auvers from Above, 
Pissarro's example led Cezanne to lighten his palette still further. Cezanne also adopted the short brushstrokes used by Pissarro, a technique forever associated with the age of Impressionism. Under the influence of Pizarro, he moved away from his earlier um, lavish brush strokes and went more into the Impressionist style, using smaller brush strokes and directional brush strokes. His colour lightened too. Cezanne's brushwork continued to evolve, like all other aspects of his art, and it would become very different to that of Camille Pizarro. But the benevolent figure of Pissarro had a positive effect on Cézanne. At Pontoise and at Auvers, he began to enjoy his outdoor painting. He took more time over his work. Images such as House of the Hanged Man reveal a far stronger sense of control than his wild 1860s paintings. Cézanne also started to use colour to unify the painting rather than relying on the structure of conventional perspective. A powerful chromatic unity would be a trademark feature of Cezanne's mature work, but by 1873, his early period was still not quite over. That year, he also worked on this canvas, a modern Olympia, a deliberately provocative painting inspired by this Manet image that had outraged audiences at the 1865 Salon. Both works depict a contemporary prostitute. But Cezanne chose to include himself in this swirling, sensual picture. He also chose to exhibit the work at the 1874 exhibition organized by Pissarro and his fellow artists from the Café Gerbois. Cézanne may have thought that this radical, independent event would pave the way to fame and fortune. If he did, he was wrong. Cézanne was one of the first of the modern artists who had not a corpus of, of work which was, was profoundly academic. That is, for instance, life drawings of very academic nature, which was, for instance, even Picasso had that. Uh, but Cézanne didn't. And his approach to the figure was always, um, to many people, uh, simply wrong. It was badly drawn and uh, his paintings were daubs and so all of these criticisms came to bear in those earlier works. That hurt him of course. The 1874 Impressionist show is now the stuff of legend. Works by painters now recognized as giants were savaged by the critics of the time. The word Impressionism itself derived from a derisory comment made about this 1874 exhibit, Claude Monet's Impression Sunrise. The whole event was a commercial and critical failure. But of all the works on display, none received more critical abuse than those exhibited by Paul Cézanne. Modern Olympia was described as the work of a lunatic, while his House of the Hanged Man was also loudly condemned. It was not mainstream in any way. It wasn't even mainstream Impressionism. It was not taken seriously. He copied Manet's Olympia, for example, in a way which people found utterly ridiculous, and we're not really sure if he did it as a joke or not. It was really his subject matter, I think, and, and, in, and his wild paintings, his wild brushwork in, in his more traditional subject matter, not, I think, in his portraits or his landscapes. Unsurprisingly, the thin-skinned Cézanne reacted badly. He was 35, still unknown and still dependent on a father he hated. He was acquainted with other artists in the same position, but even this was little consolation. The one major supporter that the Impressionist artist did have was Emile Zola, now an established star of Parisian literary life. But Zola's support for his old school friend was qualified with doubts about his technique, and this hurt the artist still more. Shortly after the first Impressionist show, his work did find an admirer a customs inspector named Victor Choquet. The two men got on well, and Cézanne painted Choquet in a portrait exhibited at the Third Impressionist Exhibition of 1877. 
Again, the event did nothing for Cezanne's critical reputation. The critics savaged the canvas. One even suggested that his portrait of Choquet should not be viewed by pregnant women in case it made them miscarry. If Cezanne felt bitter at the critical condemnation of his work, it fails to reveal itself in any of his self-portraits. These are images that give nothing away. They are paintings that are intended to be paintings and nothing more. There is none of the psychological insight of a Rembrandt in the Cezanne self-portrait, but it's not difficult to guess at what this stony-faced artist was feeling at the time. Cezanne was a deeply miserable individual. Around the time this image was completed, its subject was staying with his old friend Zola at the writer's smart new home at Medan. Zola was now a wealthy and influential figure, very much at ease in polite society. Cezanne was the exact opposite, a failure whose abrupt, withdrawn personality he did nothing to correct. But still he pursued his self-defined artistic vision. In his own phrase, he sought to paint constructions after nature. Painting on a flat surface, a two-dimensional surface, and creating the illusion of three dimensions is something which, whilst it had been clearly tackled successfully through the Renaissance, through the theories of perspective, was not necessarily the only way, or certainly the way which Cezanne himself felt w w was right. And therefore, he, he thought of his works, his paintings, actually as constructing with the paint, colour, uh, the brushwork, and so on. And so we get that, that sense of construction, which is a funny word because it's, it's been used in modern art in a variety of ways. But I think for Cezanne, it meant actually, if you like, going back to basics and translating the three-dimension onto the two-dimensional surface in what transpires, as we see it now, is a new way of doing things. He wanted to put dabs of colour on the canvas because that was what was in front of him. He didn't want to call it a tree or a rock, he just wanted to record it. And this meant that he built the picture up basically from colour and almost didn't know what it was going to be like when he'd finished it. And this is a construction of a painting which happens to be of often of a landscape, sometimes, of course, of people. While staying with Zola, he painted this canvas, the Chateau at Medan, a landscape which gives us a clue as to his radical intentions. It's got a lot of organised brushstrokes in it. In the water, for example, at the bottom of the painting, you've got horizontal brushstrokes, many colours, different colours but all horizontal brushstrokes. In the land and in the sky, the brushstrokes are all diagonal, going in the same direction, but in different colours. And the houses have horizontal and vertical brushstrokes in. So it's extremely well organised. It gives the sense of control, if you like, over his medium and over his subject, and a lovely integration of them both which doesn't actually detract from the spontaneity and the freshness of his vision. Without Zola's early encouragement, the timid Cezanne may never have followed his artistic muse. But the relationship between the two friends was not to last much longer. In 1886, Zola published his latest novel, L'Oeuvre. Its principal character was Claude Lantier, a failed artist who eventually commits suicide. The inspiration for the character was obvious. Lantier was based unmistakably on Paul Cézanne. It was a literary humiliation and the artist was devastated. After reading the novel with horror, Cézanne wrote a short note to Zola, formally thanking him for a copy of the book. But the tone of the letter was clear. Their friendship was now over, and the two men would never meet again. In truth, they had been growing apart for years. Zola was now, more than ever, the gregarious society figure. 
Cezanne was now even more withdrawn as he pursued his own artistic vision with solitary intensity. His 1886 marriage to Hortense Fiquet did nothing to alter this. And another significant event the same year pushed the artist further into isolation. The death of his father meant that Paul Cezanne inherited enough wealth to be financially independent. Now he could work without worrying about what the critics thought. For the remaining two decades of his life, that is exactly what he did. When we think about what Cezanne was trying to do and how do we discern what he was trying to do, I think we've got to remember some of the things he said about the things that influenced him. He was profoundly influenced by the old masters, particularly people like, well, Poussin, the French 17th century artist, people like Rubens and so on, and of course earlier 19th century ones uh, like Courbet. And he wanted to, to produce contemporary work which could stand on a par with the major masters of the past. So in a sense he had this somewhat unrealistic, to many, uh, very high aim. And yet it seemed to be at odds with what was actually being produced in terms of what the contemporary, the thought, was, should be produced and what was great. Cezanne could now follow his own artistic vision. Specifically, he sought to capture the underlying structure of nature in his painting. To do this, he needed to develop a new way of depicting space and the spatial relationships between objects. Some years before his father died, Cezanne painted this canvas, the bridge at Mainzi, an image that reveals the artist's willingness to innovate in pursuit of his bold artistic aims. He was now attempting to convey a sense of perspective through painted colour. Colour itself was something which created depth. There had always been a certain uh, understanding of depth in colour, but this was going much, much further than that. And that the application of colour, of the shape of that colour, of the thickness of the paint, the relationship of one colour to another, not according to any traditional academic theory, but, in, but experimenting and seeing, in a sense, what would happen. And so he's building, in flat two-dimensional terms, the illusion of depth. In that sense, yes, that could be called perspective, although I would not use that term perspective, because I think that's a particular Renaissance set of theories. Perspective through colour was just one technique adopted by Cezanne as he sought to depict the three-dimensional constructions of nature on a flat, two-dimensional canvas. In the early 1880s, he painted a series of canvases depicting the Bay of Marseille, as seen from Lastac. In these pictures, we can see one of the greatest achievements of Cezanne's career, the technique known as flat-depth painting. the organisation of brush strokes over the surface of the canvas because of the colour that he uses and the delicacy sometimes also of the touch manages to convey a sense of depth although that was not primarily what he was necessarily interested in. Words are becoming less and less relevant to an understanding because what Cezanne, along with others at the time, were doing were bringing us back to the pure language of the visual arts, which is non-verbal. The Renaissance had, and certainly by the 19th century, uh, relied very heavily upon the relationship with words, anecdotal or storytelling or whatever. Um, but here we get a break. Cezanne is bringing us back to the visual. And the translation of the three-dimensional object onto a two-dimensional surface using the relationships of colours in planes and flats, it doesn't follow the, the logical order of Renaissance theory. That's why it wasn't understood at the time, and that's why people thought of it as daubs or as bad painting. We now see it, through the eyes of Picasso, Braque and others later on, as being a profoundly deep new approach, a more realistic approach, if you like, to the translation of three dimensions onto two dimensions. In other words, to bring the reality of three dimensions. 
By the late 1880s, Cézanne had mastered his remarkable flat depth technique. His detested father was now gone, and he could concentrate on advancing his art still further. But he was still a fearsomely difficult man to live with. He was given to terrible fits of rage, and he developed a pathological fear of being touched, even by his own son. There is a sense of physical distance in the portraits of Paul Cézanne, Jr., painted by his father. Images like these contain little affection, but this is hardly surprising. They are paintings of a construction after nature. The fact that the construction concerned is the artist's own son is irrelevant. Perhaps more than any other painter, Cézanne knew what he wanted to achieve. He had his own distinctive artistic agenda, which can reasonably be described as an unprecedented philosophy of painting. They were radical in the sense that he was actually aware of abstraction. He wanted to organize his, the, the surface of the canvas in a way, in a conscious way, which the Impressionists didn't want to do. They weren't so much interested in the patterns of the paint on the canvas as the feeling they were able to arouse through the use of the paint. Cézanne was not interested in arousing feelings I believe in his work, he wanted something more structured, more intellectual, if you like, more enduring than feelings were. By the year 1895, Paul Cézanne was spending most of his time in Provence, working obsessively while his wife and son stayed most of their time in Paris. He was virtually unknown, but that year, the art dealer, Ambroise Voyard, organized the first one-man exhibition of work by an artist who was now 56 years of age. This time, the critical reception was much warmer. People were beginning to understand what Cézanne was trying to achieve. Typically, the artist did not attend the exhibition, preferring to stay in Provence and work. In the 10 years of life that he had left, his painting virtually took over his life. The results were astonishing. Cézanne and his art had matured in his landscapes, in his still lifes, and in his portraits. Many of these depict his wife, Hortense, who was prepared to sit for her husband on the occasions that she did stay with him. This would have been a thankless task for her. Cézanne was notoriously rude and abusive with his models and often insisted on dozens of sittings before he was satisfied. Typically, portraits of Hortense are not studies in marital affection. With an 1877 image showing Madame Cézanne in a red armchair, the artist is more concerned with using colour to unify the flat canvas than in capturing any expression of his wife's personality. A later work, depicting Hortense in a conservatory, is similarly artistic in its inspiration. Here, it is the physical structure of his wife that concerns the artist most. This architectural approach can also be seen in Woman with a Coffee Pot, a canvas from the early 1890s, which reveals Cézanne's fondness for strong diagonal elements in his figure compositions. The use of diagonals is a compositional device which provides a strength, but it also provides a means whereby the figures themselves, whilst they are figures, become part of the structure alongside the trees, the natural forms. For much of his later portrait work, Cézanne chose not to use professional models. But an 1895 canvas was an exception, boy in a red waistcoat is a portrait of Michelangelo di Rosa, a professional Italian sitter. But Cézanne's later portraits are more typically depictions of ordinary Provençal people. And in many of them, the artist conveys a far greater sense of character than those images of his family. Man with a pipe is a good example of this. There is a sense of personality here. This is a real man, as well as being a real construction after nature. This 
greater sense of sympathy to character can also be detected in Cezanne's memorable late series of paintings depicting card players. But with such an image, it is, once again, the arrangement of the painting that is most significant. The table is not seen from a uniform angle. Different areas of it are seen from different viewpoints. This phenomenon emerges in Cezanne's still life work. An 1890 canvas known as the kitchen table is an example. To consider just two elements of the composition, we appear to look down on the vase, whereas the fruit basket is seen from a level position. This technical innovation can be seen in many of Cezanne's still lifes, an innovation that was to be of great interest to painters of subsequent generations, the technique of multiple perspective. He took a very long time. He worked hard trying to interpret. If we take a still life, he would take months over it. He came in uh, and he stood up and painted it and looked at it, explored it. And then he came in again after lunch, say, and stood a bit differently. And perhaps he sat down. Uh, and so what was happening was his viewpoint in attempting to find out what the objects were, uh, he was moving his viewpoints to find out how that apple looked on that dish, how that chair looked against that table. So what we're getting is a painting which takes on its own life and its own uniqueness. The important thing to modern art was not what he himself necessarily thought about, but what people thought they saw in that work. If I had to pick up one strand of Cezanne's work, which was fundamental to 20th century work, it is the multiple viewpoints of his still lives. The system of multiple perspective is just one feature of Cezanne's work which inspired the artists who came after him. This 1899 portrait is another image which looks forward to the art of the 20th century. Non-representational colour has become so prevalent in modern works of art that it's fascinating to see its pioneering use by a 19th century master. Cézanne has been described as the father of modern painting, and with very good reason. We cannot fail to recognize this 1895 still life as being a painting of the modern age. It is essentially an image of simplicity, revealing a sense of geometric construction that later artists also found deeply inspiring. Cézanne himself explained the basis for this radical construction technique. He said that all objects all things that could be painted could be reduced to three geometric solids, the cone, the cylinder, and the sphere. It is certainly the case that he saw underlying the individual form of a tree, um, a bank, a bridge, a human being, that there were fundamental forms of which geometric forms uh, form part. And in that sense, that is my understanding of what he was meaning. I think it was a rather theoretical concept that he had that didn't necessarily appear in his paintings very clearly at all, but it was these concepts of the cylinder cone and sphere that was actually taken up later by Picasso, and that's why we hear so much about it. The geometric solidity at the heart of Cezanne's work is what takes it beyond Impressionism and into the modern age. In 1906, Pablo Picasso revealed Le Demoiselle d'Avignon to an astonished world. It was the first ever work of Cubism, and Picasso himself based its composition on a Cezanne canvas completed in the previous year. This is The Great Bathers, the finest in a series of three ambitious paintings in which Cezanne sought to bring together all the artistic innovations that he had developed over the previous decades. In The Great Bathers, the landscape and the figures are both constructions from nature. There is no distinction between them. As Cezanne once said, the landscape becomes human, becomes a thinking, living being within me. I become one with my picture. The Large Bathers is Cezanne's attempt at integrating the human body with the natural world. And this is something he'd become interested in doing latterly, I believe, 
ever since he'd done the card players, for example, which was a composition of people in, inside, in fact, or possibly outside, it's not quite clear. But of course it brings together his two interests, which are people and still lives, um, and landscape. He treats the people as if they're part of the landscape. In, in the Grand Bathers, there are diagonals coming in from both sides. The people are di the women are diagonal, the trees are diagonal. I don't think it works, but I think it's a very great um, aspiration on his part to want to do this. He's trying, I think, to be classical, and yet within a new framework. I can see them as a logical extension of Suzanne's belief that he was trying to produce the art of the museum. The satisfying and basic um, compositional form is, is that arch, that, that triangle, that firm based, long base, rising up to a point at the top. If Cezanne believed that landscape became a thinking, living being when he was engaged in painting it, then there can be no doubt which landscape feature he was most familiar with. We could almost say that it became his most intimate friend in his later life, Mont Saint-Victoire. All his life, Cézanne was fascinated by this isolated peak 10 miles from his birthplace. In all, he painted it on 60 occasions, beginning with its inclusion in his 1870 painting, The Cutting. Three decades later, with the artist now in his 60s and ill with diabetes, he continued to go out each morning to paint Mont Saint-Victoire from every conceivable angle. The Mont Saint-Victoire paintings cover the whole of Cézanne's oeuvre, really. He was doing them in the 60s and he was doing them in the 1904, shortly before his death. So we can see very clearly in these paintings how his technique developed from the early um, blocks of colour, fairly simple landscapes, to the later ones where they're almost abstract in that maybe the whole canvas isn't c covered by paint and there are patterns on the surface um, very, very delicate works, and, and it's because he did it so frequently that we, that, that we have this valuable insight into his working methods. To me, those Mont Saint-Victoire ones are Cézanne becoming part of that landscape and interpreting that. He did it in oil paint, he did it in watercolours. One of the things in his watercolours that I always find fascinating is that uh, he's increasingly uh, taken a decision that uh, he doesn't need to fill the whole of the, the paper, the rectangle, that scene, does not have to be something which filled the frame, and that the space left was as important as the space which was filled in. Whether or not he, that was absolutely intentional in the sense that we've seen it later on, I don't know, but it certainly is something which, again, was crucial to some artist, to realising that, again, rather like medieval work, you only put in what is essential. It's a process, it's a method. You see the method and the process working together. On October the 15th, 1906, Paul Cézanne was painting outdoors at a small village overlooked by the mountain that had so inspired him. Caught in a rainstorm, he contracted a chill which developed into pneumonia. His doctor ordered him to rest, but the sick artist insisted on continuing to paint. But his body was no longer strong enough. On October the 22nd, 1906, Paul Cézanne died. Typically, his wife and son were not in attendance when death came. It was a solitary end to a solitary existence, a life in which everything was art and art was everything. Cézanne's achievement after slaving away for 40 years and having no recognition at all, or hardly any, was in the 20th century to be the father of a whole new way of seeing the relation of motif to the flat surface of the canvas.
and the idea of abstract art, of course, also came partly from him, developed by Picasso and Braque, where they were looking at an object from several different points of view in Cubism, and at the same time playing with the surface of the canvas with their brush strokes and patterns and just generally having a fantastic time in quite a cerebral fashion. And this, I think, goes back to what Cezanne was doing. It's generally recognised that Cezanne's work was fundamental to the final destruction of what I call Renaissance art, that is, an approach to painting in particular, which is based upon the theories of perspective produced in the uh, 15th century in Italy, and which was the basis right up to the 19th century. It's a very big claim to make for somebody, and actually it's rather larger than Cezanne himself was, cl was claiming for himself. But I think he is significant. He does mark a change. Cezanne was doing the work, then out of it came the new. Shortly before his death, Cezanne spoke of how his art was, at last, approaching the promised land. Around this time, others were beginning to share his viewpoint. In the years that followed, the sheer genius of this difficult man from Provence became recognized throughout the art world. By the end of the 20th century, individual works by Cezanne could fetch a price in excess of 15 million pounds. For once, financial value alone reveals the magnitude of a stupendous artistic achievement.